really to build uh, successes for their projects. Without further ado, uh, Jessica Roberts is our first speaker. She has been making the world a better place for biking and walking since 2001. At Alta Planning and Design, Jessica leads the Unique Programs team who creates behavior change through, through education, encouragement, and media campaigns. Her current research focuses on better evaluation as well as integrating methods from public health and behavior, behavioral economics it's a mouthful, into campaigns. And she also serves on the board of APDP. Jessica? And I get really excited about this stuff, so I'm going to time myself so I don't go over time. I'm not checking Facebook. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, Snapchat. That's so cool. Um, all right, so uh, I actually I know that normally what we do is we tell you about some specific project that we did, um, and, and I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to preview for you um, some uh, research that we will be publishing in, I think it'll come out publicly in November, on behalf of Transit Center. Um, is Kirk from Transit Center here? He may have had to present at this time. Um, so uh, if you haven't heard of Transit Center, you need to know about them. They are um, a foundation out of New York that is seeking to improve transit um, in the United States. Um, and um, they are investing in a lot of very, very interesting research reports and projects. And their definition of improving transit is very, very broad and includes all kinds of behavior change um, and TDM. So we uh, were lucky enough to apply for one of their first grants and um, receive some funding to do some research on um, innovative funding methods for behavior change campaigns. And so a few of you may have been in my presentation right before this and know a little bit more about individualized marketing campaigns. Uh, for those of you who do, that's what we were talking about. But it doesn't matter because what we're what I'm presenting to you today, I screamed with my hat on of like, could this be of use to anyone who's seeking to influence people's travel behavior, um, no matter what your role is. Um, though I do think it's probably worth saying that I'm not sure if all of these methods are as well suited to infrastructure interventions. But we can, we can ask ourselves that. I, but I think any of these would be um, of interest if you're doing programmatic work of any type. So, um, we did a lot of background research, stakeholder interviews, talking to experts from within our field, from other fields, to say, how could we better figure out whether our investments are working, um, and how can we explain them better? So I will share with you a few of the tools that we have learned about and that we are starting to apply in, in our work at Alta, um, and that we hope and think can be of service to our field. So the first one is the use of logic models. Please raise your hand if you've heard of this. Keep them raised if you've used one. Okay, wonderful. So we have a lot of people in the room who are arguably more experts on this than I. Um, what I have learned is that this is a very common technique that's used in especially public health. Um, but in my experience, it's just starting to be used in transportation. Um, and the idea is super, super, super simple. You have some assumptions about why what you're doing works. Or maybe I should say you start with a goal in mind and you decide what you're going to do to accomplish that goal. Presumably there's a connection between what you're doing and, and what your goal is. Um, but you may have that more in your mind or you may have talked about it within your team. A logic model just makes explicit and graphical uh, what you do and how you believe that leads to the outcome that you want. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do logic models. Some of them are a little uh, scarier looking than others, but the most common way is to break the categories down into resources or inputs, meaning basically what assets do you have? People time, uh, materials, um, maybe consultant time, you know, what, what, are, what do you have available to you to work with? Activities, what do you do with those? Um, how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? Outputs. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of evaluation ends. Um, you know, what did you do? We had X meetings, we did X presentations, we gave up 2,700 bike maps, you know. Uh, it's important, but it's only important if you believe it gets to outcomes, which is like, you know, short to medium term changes in behavior, and impacts, like why are you bothering to do that? So, to give you an example, we decided to do some dog fooding, and, uh, try this on our Smart Trips program model. I'm not gonna work, walk you through the whole thing because I've used it four minutes already. Um, but you know, we asked ourselves like, what are our resources? 
what do we do with them? So for example, our resources might include uh, community partners. Uh, activities that we do in this case maybe you know having meetings with our community partners and coming up with a formal partnership agreement um, outputs in this case might be what do we want our community partners to do they send out a certain number of Facebook posts on our behalf or they allow us access to present to their constituency a certain number of times uh, the short-term outcomes might be things like increasing awareness of travel options in in the target area so, so far you can see that like that's super important. We probably aren't gonna get to behavior change if we don't increase awareness. Um, but I don't care if people are aware if they don't do anything with it. So we have to continue to the next step of saying, so what? Um, so uh, intermediate outcome, fewer drive alone trips. Permanent, uh, long-term outcome, permanent decrease in drive alone trips and impact. Why are we bothering? Increase health and safety, support the low fuel economy, reduce carbon emissions, whatever it, your goals are. So if you want to spend more time looking at this, I'd love to share this with you and get your critique. But I have to move on. Uh, stages of change. This is now a different topic. Shifting. Okay, so uh, stages of change is a way of, of talking about um, uh, how and why people change their behavior. Um, also called the trans theoretical model, but that's a little more of a mouthful, so I'm gonna say stages of change. Um, and the idea is that uh, people's mental attitude towards the behavior that you're asking them to change is the most important determinant to whether they will in fact do what you are asking them to do. Um, so it's not necessarily whether they have a bike map, it's whether they want to start biking and that we need to assess that. Um, so the stages as they've been defined are pre-contemplation which I'll go ahead and preview. So in the context of my type of programs, that might mean basically, I drive everywhere and I like it that way. Contemplation, I drive everywhere, but sometimes I'm feeling like that's not a great use of time or I sure spend a lot of time away from my family or like uh, I wish I could get more exercise. Uh, I'm, starting to, I'm starting to consider other options. Preparation, I actually wanna make a change. I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm gathering information and I'm setting the intention. Action, I'm finally ready to give it a try. I'm going to leave the car at home you know, for a certain trip, try something new, um, but it's not a habit yet. It might still be hard for me or I might still feel tentative. And maintenance is habitual and confident use. Like I, I do this, it's not a problem. So from a program design perspective, the important thing to know is that the intervention, the, the thing I <laughs> communicate to you, um, that works for someone in one stage is completely inappropriate for someone in another stage. Kind of makes sense, right? If someone is like, I drive everywhere and I like it that way, being like, so here's how you change a flat tire on your bike is not stage appropriate. Um, and likewise, if someone's like, how do I change a flat tire on my bike? Being like, you know, lots of people feel really healthy when they bike more. It's just not helpful to them. And so by understanding, um, this is called the segmentation process, in which stage people fall, uh, we can provide um, stage specific interventions. We can provide them with uh, what is just right for them. So it has great implications for program design but from an evaluation perspective also, if I can tell my, um, my community not just how much behavior I changed, but how many people I moved from, let's say, pre-contemplation to preparation, that's actually huge. But it sort of falls below you know, most of our, the tip of the iceberg, right? You're, you're not seeing what's underneath the water. That still can be an important contribution of your program. So I think this allows us to daylight some of the, um, the steps that happen before hard change that still are um, worthwhile outcomes of our investments. Passive tracking. Um, in this context, in a TDM room, I have to say is really hard to talk about because it's hard to automatically sense a transit trip. As of today, ask me in six months, it'll be different. But it's very easy to automatically sense uh, whether you took a walking or a biking trip with your Fitbit or with your Moves app on your phone, or Endo, Mondo, or Strava, or whatever you're using, it's actually quite easy. So in this audience, I can tell you, um, the technology is already there. And if you work with someone who knows how to build web apps, um, you can have access to it. So an example is, uh, in where I live in Portland, our advocacy organization did the Bike More Challenge this year in partnership with Love to Ride. Um, I know they have two team members here at the conference if you wanna talk with them more about their, their um, platform, but in the past for this sort of a challenge, I would have had to log on every day and log my bike trips. All I did this time was said, you know, 
uh, connect with moves. And, and then my phone reported automatically. This was a one month bike challenge. It was so easy. And the quality of data collected was very high. Um, I'm running out of time, and I, so we can talk about that personally. If you want to know more about like uh, calculations we can do, like other things we could measure, um, and calculations we can do with VMR. But I do want to talk briefly about A-B testing. Um, so uh, this is something that um, we already know perfectly well from like drug trials, right? It, you, you take your group of people that represents you know everyone you want to reach. You divide them randomly into two groups. You maybe have a control. They don't get the treatment, you have a treatment group, and then you see what happens. This is very, very simple, right? But in the context of um, uh, the programmatic work we do, we're really not operating at this level. And what this allows us to do is isolate variables. So if I want to do some message testing to see how I can get people in to sign up for my program in the most cost-effective way possible, I can actually test message A against message B, or if I have enough people, I can test like six messages, you know? And if you design this correctly, you can actually know with confidence what worked. Once we build a, a knowledge base, which we have many, many years of work to do because this, no one's doing this yet, um, except TransLink here in BC is about to do this. Uh, but once we have a knowledge base, we can also use this method to test packages of um, interventions that we know ha have been effective in other places against each other. So in terms of program design, you can say, well, here's package A, here's package B which one is more effective, let's do that. Um, that's known as micro-targeting in like political research. I'd love to talk with you more about that, but we are at the knowledge building uh, moment. So what we need to do is start saying, I have a hypothesis about what works better for messaging or for treatment um, and start testing it out and reporting back to each other about what works. I have to stop, sorry. <laughs> and more slides, but you can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica, for setting the stage and telling the theory. Um, we're going to go through all of the, I should have said this at the beginning, uh, we're going to go through all the presenters and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, but I think Jessica did a great job of setting some of the theory and, and the thought thinking behind it. Um, our next speaker, Leslie Lara, is going to present some of the research. Um, I was actually involved as a researcher in this project. And we did spend a lot of time trying to think about how, in particular, the stages of change model can work up, be applied to short-term projects. Um, in San Francisco School World, um, it is really hard to show behavior change. But, and so how can we use these theory, this, uh, all of this theory to say that even shifting people's perceptions of walking and biking and, and is, is actually a substantial benefit to the program. So without further ado, uh, Leslie Lara is the Program Manager at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission for the San Francisco Bay Area. She manages two of the agency's climate initiatives programs, which include the Bay Area's annual Bike to Work program, as well as Spare the Air Youth, which is a school and youth outreach educa and education effort that encourages kids and their families to choose active transportation modes. Leslie is also part of the agency's outreach team, and she works to inform the region's 7 million residents about MTC's planning work. Thank you, Hannah and Jessica. Um, good morning or afternoon, or well, still morning, um, everyone. So I have a quick disclaimer to, uh, for you all. Um, my colleague who actually led our um, evaluation efforts on the Regional Safe Routes to School program retired a couple of years ago. And so I'm not very knowledgeable <laughs> about the evaluation. Um, but um, so I'm gonna be reading off my phone for my notes um, and I'm actually not cool because I have no idea how to use Snapchat. <laughs> but I'm reading my really notes. <laughs> um, so here's a little bit of background about uh, safe routes to school in the Bay Area. Um, sorry. We have uh, one of the, uh, the oldest uh, safe routes to school pro uh, programs in the United States. It started back in 1998 as a pilot for um, our newly adopted uh, transportation authorization bill. Um, and fast forward to 2010, uh, well 2009, uh, MTC adopted what is called the Climate Initiatives Program. And uh, we established this program in order to meet a state mandate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which was a law that was adopted in 2008. Um, and 
the, the Climate Initiatives Program was adopted to identify programs and initiatives that would um, effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we adopted all these different strategies and we included a regional Safe Routes to School program which was basically funding for all the Safe Routes to School programs in our region. Um, it was an obvious choice for because uh, in the Bay Area the Safe Routes to School program has a very long uh, background. Um, because the Safe Routes to School, uh, Regional Safe Routes to School program was in the Climate Initiatives program, we were required to conduct an evaluation in order to gauge um, the emissions reductions that resulted from um, the program. So today, these are all the programs that are in the Bay Area. Uh, we have a very diverse region, and for that reason, we have very diverse implementation in our uh, nine counties, for example, in Alameda County, we have a uh, local uh, centralized uh, county-run program, whereas uh, in Santa Clara County, for example, we have the transit agency or the local uh, congestion man management agency directing the funding to individual um, safe routes to school programs in in each, uh, well, in some other cities, so not all their cities have not all the cities in the county have a safe routes to school program, but this is just an illustration of the diversity of how the program is run and the way it exists in our region. So um, as I mentioned, uh, first and foremost, the goal of our evaluation was to measure the greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, uh, that resulted from the program. But um, in the process of conducting the evaluation, uh, we wanted to also identify other key successes. Um, here's the timeline of the project. We actually, uh, so uh, as Hannah mentioned, Alta led the evaluation effort for MTC um, in partnership with ICF International. And Hannah, I'm glad she's here because she had the tremendous task of collecting all of the data from our myriad of programs that we have in the Bay Area. Um, and the evaluation began in the spring of 2011, and we completed it um, in uh, late two, 2014, and I mean completed because we actually haven't finalized our evaluation report, but we're still working on it. Um, as I mentioned, Hannah had the tremendous task of collecting all the data from all the programs um, and then crunching the numbers with ICF. Um, and as you can see here, we conducted tons and tons of data, um, including data from thousands of student hand tallies and uh, thousands of um, parent surveys. Um, so in total, we collected data from 329 schools in our region, uh, which uh, represented eight of our nine um, Bay Area counties. And the results from the evaluation were actually pretty significant. Um, in terms of the mode split, it showed that about 45% uh, of school trips um, annually are made using some kind of active uh, transportation. Um, it also showed um, other remarkable successes. For example, um, students who participate in a Safe Routes to School program in the Bay Area walk almost 200,000 miles more annually and also bike almost 150,000 miles more um, annually. And on average, uh, the per student annual miles driven in the family vehicle decreased by uh, 6.2 miles. Um, in terms of emissions reductions, which was uh, one of the main purposes, or started off as the main purpose of our evaluation, we showed that um, Safe Routes to School could save approximately uh, 1,900 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And I believe this is per year, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we did find that the impacts of the program change over time um, with very high behavior change during the first two years of implementation and then uh, gradually decreasing. But after two years, it shows that there's still um, some behavior change happening um, with a 13% increase um, after the two years. Uh, we also found that the program participation varies widely in terms of the number of activities um, 
that each school decides to implement. So for example, in Alameda County, they were doing uh, four, on average, about four activities in a school uh, per year, whereas in San Francisco and Sonoma, they were doing many, many more activities. Um, we also found that the most uh, successful aspects of the Safe Routes to School program are actually holding uh, frequent walk and roll to school events. Um, so like an annual, I mean not an annual, but like a monthly or a weekly day when everybody bikes or walks to school. Um, those are very successful. And also having uh, walking school buses and bike trains at schools are uh, uh, actually very successful in changing behavior. Um, in terms of next steps, we are going to continue coordinating at the uh, regional level with, through our Spare the Year Youth Program, which is the program that I manage. Um, we are continuing funding for our regional um, Safe Routes program, um, and we are also going to um, continue. Uh, we found that the more successful programs from the evaluation are the ones that are administered at the re uh, county level. So we're going to continue to push for um, a more centralized um, form of implementation. Um, and then we're going to provide technical assistance to our local um, program so that they are able to the evaluate the pro continue evaluating the programs. Um, and with that, one thing I'd like to add is that because, um, as Leslie mentioned, that it's still being finalized at the MTC level, but we did. Um, speak with all the partners and, uh, and all of the coalitions and um, all of the graphics that you saw we created those so that um, the communities could talk about the data um, and include them in their presentations and use that, that to support their, uh, their efforts. And I, we've been hearing that that's been really helpful for them to communicate to their elected officials, their communities, um, what the impact of their program is, both the specific, what, that, what happened during the study that we did, and then also um, some of the numbers are projecting if, you know, if they were to apply the program to the whole uh, community, the whole Bay Area. So finally, we have Gwen Shaw um, presenting. Gwen has been involved with Better Block P PDX Portland um, since it began in 2015 when she led the Portland State University's engineering capstone team through the project. Since graduating with her civil, civil engineering degree, Gwen has continued to work with Better Block PDX to make her hometown a better place for people. She's helped institutionalize Better Block PDX with Portland State and has developed a sustainable program for students, city staff, and community members to work together towards the goal. In her non-volunteer time, she's a transportation analyst for Lancaster Engineering and Street Lab, where she merges her tactical urbanism and public process experiences to provide clients with comprehensive solutions to their transportation issues. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gwen Shaw, um, as Hannah mentioned. So I'm going to kind of talk about the Better NATO project, which if you're unfamiliar with the city of Portland, it's the NATO Parkway is the road that's parallel to the east or the west side waterfront parkway. So it's this big, formerly Harbor Drive, and it's been turned into just um, an arterial, and then we, we changed it a little bit more than that. So I'm going to talk about that and the two years of projects that we did and the data and results we found. And I'm also going to talk about the PSU institutionalization that we formed with the school and then also our relationship with the Portland Bureau of Transportation, because we've been working very closely with them and making sure that these projects are um, very sanctioned with the city while still pushing boundaries and being able to be creative. Um, so pretty much on NATO Parkway, um, we get 700,000 people during the summer months that are coming to the city for the, or coming to this area for events, festivals, runs, all sorts of, you know, there's doggy walks, there's, little, there's everything, 700,000 people. And right now it's you know a two-lane roadway in each direction with a center median and a narrow bike lane, and then no sidewalks in, on the park side because you go, normally you can just walk in the park. Um, when the festivals come in, they bring the fences all the way out to the edge, and so people are forced to wait in line in the street, as you can see. Um, they're forced, the pedestrians are into the bike lane as you're walking, and then bicyclists are forced to ride into the um, Travel lane, and so what we did is we turned that northbound lane of NATO Parkway, the easternmost one, 
into a two-way separated bicycle and pedestrian pathway, multi-use pathway. We had, I mean, all users. Um, people were rolling, people were skateboarding, longboarding. It was really amazing. We actually even set it up for the first time in 2015. Um, our first one was in collaboration with Rose Festival, which is one of the biggest, the biggest festivals that we have downtown. And um, we set it up at four in the morning, all using cargo bikes and longboards. We didn't have a single truck. It was put out just with volunteers, 4 a.m. We were done by 10, and it was pretty amazing. And so that's kind of what we've been doing. Um, we had a second installation a couple months, or about a month after that first one in 2015. It came back for the Oregon Brewers Fest because people were realizing there's definitely some issues during this festival and people were using it. Um, so with that first year of data, we were able to take counts since, as Hannah mentioned, it was my capstone projects. So we had a lot of you know, volunteer efforts because it was a school project and it was, we were still kind of up and coming, but we were able to get a lot of counts for that one and we found a 56% increase in bicycle using users on Native Parkway. Um, came back again the next summer, which was a little bit different. It wasn't Better Block PDX hosting it, it was we, partnered with all of the festivals and events and the city of Portland and the festivals kind of rented out the cones that we had purchased and they set it up, they brought it down, they maintained it as the festivals transitioned through the summer. Better Block had to come in for a week or two and kind of we were in charge of it because there wasn't a festival going on, but it was a very much a collaborative effort that this summer where it was three months, so start of May to the end of July. Um, and one of that thing, one of the best parts about that was that it was maintained by everyone. I have people that know I'm involved with it and they would come up and be like, oh, I was walking down and I fixed some cones for you guys because they were all you know, knocked over and so it was very much a community effort. Um, as expected, you know, there's still some issues we had to deal with loading. People were loading for the festivals and so there was all that stuff, but there were so many conversations, so many things, so much nitpicking, so much, but the general consensus was, this is great, we need to, we need to do this. So. We, the first year we really pushed social media and we had 971 tweets using the hashtag BetterNATO. Um, these are kind of just, everyone was talking. We had our signal engineer was making changes live, like he was monitoring it and making tweaks to left turn lanes just to make sure that traffic was still flowing. There weren't that many complaints. Um, more pictures and pictures and just everyone was out there. There's one in the bottom corner says, um, one bike every 18 seconds during the morning peak hour is what he was counting at that time. Um, and it was what the best part was live adjustments to the time, um, to the traffic signal, live adjustments to any issues that we had. Um, but what we really did in terms of evaluation is we really focused on what people were saying about it. Um, we were collecting data, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But it was really, what are people saying? What do people like? What do people not like? What can we do to change the on the ground factor that they're while it's going on? Um, so luckily, after the second year, we had, we have a very big bikeportland.org is our news blog thing. And he wrote, he wrote a story like, who loves and who doesn't like better NATO? And so this top graph of the blue with the little itty bitty slice of red that you can barely, barely see, 10,400 people usually ride in the northbound direction, uh, or drive in the northbound direction on the road, and 45 people wrote in saying that they didn't like it, or that they did like it, or shared whatever comments they thought were appropriate. Um, and then, but this other graph, you know, we had 110 people total, 65 wrote in po for positive support, 45 wrote in with negative support. But then if you kind of dig into the, what these narratives say, 10 to 15 minutes apparently is the increase in time. Um, a lot of that. I saw anything from people claiming it added five minutes to their commute to people adding, saying it added 45 minutes to their compute. And what was really fun about that is, oh, the best part about this is um, of the 45 people that wrote in, that wrote in negative thoughts, um, nine were in the last week and the first 36 were kind of throughout the first three months and they were during, mostly during the festivals, or the times that there weren't festivals. And so people were concerned, you know, I don't see all these people, why do we need this right now? But uh, to contrast that, of the 65 people that wrote in showing support, there were nine throughout the three months, and then there was some other activist groups um, did a big social media push and letter writing push, and they, um, we had 56 in the last week that were showing support, writing to the commissioners personally. Um, ugh, so, some of the biggest things were that people were loving it of all ages, and the negative comments were that it was just ridiculous time. So the most fun part, and the next two slides are not that much fun to look at, but 
basically, no matter how you average it, I've looked at two different sets of data. The city of Portland collected data both years. And then um, the Oregonian, our big newspaper, they hired, or they hired out some data. They did a separate section of data. And across the board, the travel time increase was one minute for drivers. <laughs> basically, no matter how you average it, no matter what time of day, the range is you know, 30 seconds to two minutes. But across the board, it's a minute. Um, there's this big peak you can see um, in the 8 a.m. hour. I asked, and I kind of was able to look at some data system-wide. Our entire county had a peak that week. And so there must have been other things, and we haven't dug too deep into what was going on in the county, but there was a big peak across the city. So, you know, those are kind of things that we can tell, but that's not the point of our story. Our story is what people thought and how people liked it. And so, in my last couple of minutes, I'll go away from better NATO, but the PSU institutionalization, we've now kind of, NATO was the first round of the whole project, and then um, we've now set it up so that people can do it again and again, and there's students get to, um, in the summer they do project selection, so Better Block and the city works together. Um, in the fall, the planning students work together, and I actually took the class with some of Jessica and Hannah's colleagues. Um, when I did this, in the winter, the engineering capstone student takes it on and they do the design and then they do the implementation and analyze throughout the year. And so what's really great about it is normally students get to do things like this, create a CAD plan, put it on paper, and then turn in a report. But we got to turn it from this into this and really see what it was like, what it's like on the ground, what people think about it. Um, and then as a last little note, our relationship with PBOT has really grown because of this project and because of the things before and the things after. One of our other projects, um, before I was involved, but in 2013 we did a project in Third Avenue where this is the before of the street and here's the during our project. And, and, and may I? Yeah. The businesses demanded this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is the plaza space that we, or what we turned into plaza space. So here's the plaza. Um, and the best part about this is our Better Block project, so what you're seeing in these pictures, costs about $8,000 in traffic control equipment. We reduced the lane from three, or the roadway from three lanes to one way. We put in some crosswalks. We made this space. Um, and from that, the Portland Development Commission invested $80,000, and the city put in another $40,000. So we ended up with $140,000 on top of what we had done for our $8,000. And there's now, um, this is the plaza permanent. This just got done this summer. Um, and then there's, uh, on the other side of the street, you can't totally tell, but there's a protected bike lane up there. Um, and then on 2nd Avenue, which is kind of the other side of this couplet, is also now just became a parking protected bike lane. And that's all because of that uh, initial, original Better Block project. And so we've grown that relationship with the city. The, all speakers for staying on time. So now we have about 10 to 15 minutes for um, some questions and answers. Yes. And would you like to join, just stand up here? Can you can all hear us if we speak loudly? Yes. Great. Okay. So Let's do that. I'm, I'm hoping the speakers can, can talk just a little bit about the mechanics of the data and for bike and pet trips, where is someone out there sort of manually counting? And did you do that just one day? Or I, I think the challenge a lot of us face, you know, with cars, you, there's a loop counter, there's, you know, versus the, the cost could be astronomical to sort of do comprehensive counts citywide by mode um, and to do that at several points in time to, to measure effectiveness. So how did you meet that challenge? I could say one thing and then you do it. Yeah. So for NATO, the first year, which was kind of like the initial thing, we were all really starting. We actually did have two counters that were supposedly a work, supposed to work for bikes. Um, and as we're looking at the data, we realized it really just didn't work. But luckily, we also had had volunteers out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings every morning, and then in the afternoons as well. So we had students out there, volunteers that were better block people out there doing counts, and then we put that all in. Um, and then the travel time was just Bluetooth. But the pedestrians and bicyclists, another thing that I didn't really talk about is there's a parallel waterfront path on this along NATO, except that's separated by the park. And we did counts on both the waterfront path and NATO to kind of tell how we are shifting people away from it. So I think basically though, manual counts is how we were doing bike and ped stuff. 
and volunteer run, so it was right. limited capacity. Um, I'm going to answer this not related to what I presented, but I can tell you that um, a couple of my colleagues did a lot of research on automated count technology, which isn't a panacea, <laughs> as you say, but there's a lot of change happening in that field, and so I'm not doing Snapchat. I'm uh, getting the link to the white paper that they published last year um, and putting it on my Twitter feed, Jessica Roberts, so hopefully that will be of use to you. Then I can also tell you that I, I was at a conference last month um, where I got really excited about what I think will be a transformational jump in the um, quality of uh, bike ped origin destination and trip making data that's going to come out of um, automated GPS cell phone data. Um, so it can be passively harvested um, and um, linked up into trips and right now you can only get really get that for all trips. So it's actually not just cars, but it's all trips lumped together. Um, but we talked with one of the many startups working in this field and they, within I think six months, they'll be able to parse out bike ped data. So compare that to what we have now about your once a year counts yeah. <laughs> or that one project that put in that one, you know, pneumatic tube. We're going to have so much data on how people are actually traveling by foot and on bike like within a year. You'll have to pay for it though. Because <laughs> like it's, it costs money to stitch it together and come up with the algorithms and keep on top of the, you know, the, the data sources, but it'll be there. In terms of uh, packaging your data for the public, have you found a certain way to do that? And have the, has the public uh, refuted your data? And how has, I guess the third question, how has the, your, your community leaders responded to the complaints and the data you prepared? For us, for NATO, it's just, this is what I think is so funny. The first year, you know, we put out this little pretty minor report. It wasn't a ton. I had done the capstone report, but it was more about the process leading up to it. But so many people were just like, I don't believe that data. It's not right. I need to look at it. I don't believe it. It's not right. And I think that's partly why the Oregonian hired, like, hired out some data, because we were all internally like, are they trying to you know, have a headline that's just better NATO false, you know, what we were claiming? But it wasn't. It showed the exact same information. And I think that so this year, we're working on a report. It's probably going to be out at the end of this week. But so the newspaper conducted its own data? They hired um, Inrix. Come to, they has collects data like minute by minute, and so they hired it out. So I don't know how much they paid for it, but yeah, the newspaper bought data for NATO and tried to figure out what the travel time was, and it was the same as what we came up with. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> that was a fun one too. <laughs> and how did you package the data? So we're just doing pretty minor since we're a volunteer-run organization, pretty like essentially. So we. Um, I worked on a summary report, probably about 10 to 11 pages, just kind of, the biggest thing is I have one section about the travel time data, and it kind of goes over, here's the Oregonians, here's the PBOTs, here's the facts, and then the rest of it is just the people experience. What did people say? What were the, kind of those two graphs that I included? So it was just a summary report, but I mean, we're a volunteer-run organization, obviously, if we had more money, more funding, and if and when it becomes permanent, which is a big question mark right now in our city, it will be much more evaluated because we're going to be making a big investment in it. So that's to come. I'll add that I, I'm a heavy proponent of footnotes because most people are going to want the sound bite. They want the kind of flashy, this is, you know, this is a success or we saw this, um, you know, or, or extrapolating, you know, this, this is going to have a giant impact. And then there are, of course, people who are going to want to know the specifics of how you got to there. So having the footnote, having the like actual, you know, hundred-page report that somebody can go and look at, um, is really helpful. I mean, I think the question is, did you like those graphics? Was that effective? <laughs> because that's what I think our yeah. industry is heading towards: is you know those graphics that show instead of tell. But also, let's be like totally honest; they're very social media friendly, right? You can just do a. A, you know, zoom in on one individual um, chart or, or graph and, and share it really easily. So oh, no. that's where we're headed. I, I hope you all like it. And just one question to dovetail off that discussion about the travel times using the cyclical data or Bluetooth. Is that, yeah. Um, did you see any diversion? Did you measure traffic diversion? We did the first year on um, just kind of one of the parallel streets and we saw basically no impacts. Um, but so yeah, we did think about it, and then after the first year, it was kind of like, I don't think it's gonna be that bad, so we didn't check it again the next year. There was a question over here. You had the goal, and you had the, uh, what you did, the activities, and then you have the uh, results. 
productivity check, what really works, what works better, what you evaluate the means that you, you took, uh, say, okay, this works better here, this was, doesn't work, and then choose what to use, because I understand. I mean, we altered ours, since it had three installations, I think it got better with each one. You know, the first one was just two weeks, and we, there was, yeah, two weeks, and we weren't even allowed to do two-way that first week. We did it, it was just northbound for cyclists, and then two-way for pedestrians. The next year, or the next month, we had, um, the city actually put in bike signals for the southbound direction, so we could have a two-way. And so that, you know, we tweaked it a little bit that, but then people were concerned about other things. So then the next year when it came around for three months, we did tweak it a little bit. Unfortunately, we didn't document it extremely well. I mean, we have pictures and we kind of know what we did, but we didn't explicitly like make notes of that stuff as we went. But there's, I mean, you can follow Twitter conversations, you can read Bike Portland comments, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of the tweaks are all kind of in there and they're from our users. They weren't, they were basically from what people were demanding and asking for. I was talking about what people are demanding, but, uh, working. That, but if I want to take this project and put it uh, in some other city, in some <laughs> other place, I need to know uh, as an evaluation uh, tool, what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. For evaluation? I mean, yeah. Well, you do evaluate what works better. Or don't you? I, I don't know, I didn't hear that. But if I want to put it in another city, let's say in Vancouver, in one place, how do I know what tools to use? I'm sorry, are you talking like generally or specifically for the better no, data no, no, project? Generally, just, just generally. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I can say that my entire motivation for partnering with Transit Center on the research that we're doing is that having run a lot of programs mostly in the individualized marketing realm in the last decade, I am confident that the package works. But I cannot tell you which variables within that are responsible for the results that we consistently see and that has become not acceptable to me. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe something we're spending a lot of money on is a total waste of money. Maybe there's some aspect of the project that actually is counterproductive. And, you know, we, so I, I am committed, and it's going to take us a while, but I'm committed within five years to have a better answer for you. Yeah. And that's also something we dealt with in the Regional Safe Rascal School Study, where, you know, each Safe Rascal School, if you're familiar with the program, it's a toolkit of different um, interventions of, you know, some schools do a parent sneaker, some do walking school bus. And, mm -hmm. and so we collected from all of the different, so Leslie showed the slide, of the nine counties, and there were 15 different individual programs that each had their own kind of um, resources available to a specific school. So we asked each of the programs to track which activities or events were happening in each school during the time we were looking at the analysis. And so, and then we were able to say, was there a difference in the mode shift at schools that did a walking school bus versus schools that didn't? And of course, the problem is that there's so many other variables in all of the schools. There's all of these different programs that are, be, are reaching the students. There's no, the control group is a great, great idea, but it's basically impossible when you're talking about these kinds of ki you know, kids and schools and these kinds of outreach things. Um, and I, I don't think it would even be, if we could, I don't know that it, we would want to do, like hold back other uh, resources to do, to do like a control group. Um, but we were at least able to start looking at like how many, you know, we that really show that there was an impact when schools had multiple activities as opposed to a school that only had like a one one event. So, uh, you know, I also yeah, would suggest that uh, I'm sure you're, you'll share your report as soon as it's available. Um, the more if, if more places would follow some of the same Mm -hmm. approaches then you could start to look in different regions mm -hmm. does that lesson hold true I mean is it is it really about the walking school buses are the variable or is it more just like the walking school buses you happen to have are run by the best volunteers uh, you know yeah, in the country right. so we could start to look and build more right. comparable knowledge and as the is so often unfortunately the case with doing a big evaluation study half of the next steps are well, we really should collect this other data in the future. <laughs> and like one of the things, I mean, I, there's a, um, you know, a pretty well-established way of doing hand tallies and parent surveys for Safe Russell School. The National Center for Safe Russell School has great instructions for how to do that. 
but there's not really any um, guidance for how do you track participation in activities mm -hmm. or which schools are, are participating in which activities. So even in the Bay Area, we had wildly different kinds of data coming in and some places didn't even track that information. Uh, so kind of moving forward, what, what, figuring out how to do that better and do it more consistently. And it would be great to do that at the national level, really. Um, yes. Uh, Jessica, the stages have changed. Yes. I'm very interested in these segments and how is it possible, not in this sort of question period, but can you tell what of your sample product is at each of those stages? Like, Absolutely. Yeah, so we're uh, part of the, so Kirk, did you come in late or did I miss you earlier? Uh, I, I came in. Okay, okay, this is Kirk Hovenkotter with Transit Center, um, uh, and they're doing really interesting, great work, get to know him. Um, but one of the things that will come out in, in our report um, in a couple months are um, two options for segmentation questions. Uh, they will be optimized for fully multimodal programs, to be honest, but I think they could be adapted for walking only, biking only, or active transportation only. Um, it's both of the alternatives are based in um, existing stages of change research and work, uh, but they haven't been like thoroughly tested within our um, uh, practitioner community, so we want you to test them. Uh, but I can point you to the published research on this topic um, that's starting to come out. Um, and yes, I, we think that segmentation will be eminently possible with you know a few questions, either in a written survey or that can be done you know in person. Um, uh, and you're right; if you cannot segment, you can't use it. Um, and I also I couldn't cover it, but there's a lot more interesting information about like what the um, stage specific intervention strategies are that I'm, I'm happy to discuss with anyone. So I think we have time for one more question as we're coming up on lunch, but I'm sure uh, all of the speakers are happy to share more information afterwards. But yes. <laughs> Do you have tips for other advocates on how to get other DOTs to say yes to like this? Um, our biggest thing I think is we've now been working with them since like 2013. So and we have, we're trusting with them. There's a lot of, they trust us. We sh have shown that we can do stuff. Um, and our, I think, I'm trying to think of other tips um, for working with them. I think what really helped actually is the student involvement because we had PSU and so I got to go in as a student with the city engineer, city traffic engineer, and sit at a table and he's like, do you know what the MUTCD is? And I luckily said yes. The next year <laughs> students didn't and it was so embarrassing. Um, but it, so he, you know, he hand brought like a huge, old copy of it and showed me all this stuff and highlighted things with me and went over the standards. And so I think that really helped is get the students in because everyone wants to help students. The students benefit so much from it. And so, you know, we've now done two years of student involvement. We're getting ready for our next year. Um, like I said, these two, their colleagues are teaching that class, the planning class, and so we're working on it. I think that's probably the biggest thing is that kind of gave us an in to really get close with them. And now I have regular meetings with the communication staff, the engineering staff. Just, I think that's the biggest thing. And the city staff have clearly internalized, like this is a productive yeah. exploitation of what <laughs> a, a, a you know, scrappy um, energetic community group can do uh, that the city can't do. They can come in and just sort of be like, guys, we've got this crazy idea, let's do it. Let's just do it, business owners, and they're not a little more likely to say yes. And the city understands that that can be the bleeding edge that pulls, and that they need that. Another so I don't know area. how to get there, but once <laughs> you get there, I, th I think the city, and, and they're not trying to hide this, you know, they'll talk about how Timur Ender in the yeah. commissioner's office says they create the, the demand and the backup for what I really want to do. Yeah. Another thing, like one of the things for, we did a project I didn't talk about here, but it was on Northeast Broadway, and it kind of, had some big issues, so we had to tweak it halfway through the week and make all these changes. But the biggest thing that came out of that is on the road as we were out there, people did not like it. People were livid. It was, this is our throwaway. We need to have all our cars, blah, blah, blah. But it was the biggest thing. They are like, why is the city doing this? And we're like, the city is only supporting this. They're not doing it. You didn't pay, none of your tax dollars are going to this. You know, that was something people's like, faces would just be relieved when we said that. And so I think that was another thing, like as the advocacy group, that's something you get to do, not as a city, but with the city support, it makes it a lot easier. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to the speakers. Um, and feel free to come up and chat with us for a little bit yeah. before we head to lunch.